we're gonna we're gonna get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome and thank you for uh, coming to what should be a very timely and interesting event on energy security in the uh, Strait of Malacca. Um, also, like to send a very special greeting to those watching on the internet uh, around the world on our webcast. Uh, my name is Michael Kugelman. I'm with the Woodrow Wilson Center here with the Asia Program, and. Uh, I'd also like to thank several groups who helped make this event possible through their co-sponsorship. Um, two groups here at the Wilson Center, the Division of International Security Studies, I see Rob Litvak, the director, is standing in the back, thank you Rob, and the Wilson Center's Environmental Change and Security Program. Uh, is Jeff? Okay. And I'd also like to thank uh, Georgetown University's Center for Peace and Security Studies as well as the U.S. Army's Dwight D. Eisenhower National Security Series. Uh, several months ago, uh, foreign, foreign Policy Magazine designated the Strait of Malacca as one of the world's five top global choke points, and it's easy to understand why. Uh, bisecting Indonesia's Sumatra Island and Western Malaysia, this narrow waterway links the Indian and Pacific Oceans, and it serves as the shortest sea route between the Persian Gulf and Asian markets. Additionally, the Strait of Malacca is a hub of global trade. It's one of the busiest waterways in the world. Tens of thousands of ships transit the sea lane each year, constituting at least one quarter of the world's trade. And by some estimates, the value of the goods conveyed through the Strait total almost $400 billion. And given the growing economies of China and India, we can assume these figures will continue to increase. Now, if you look at history, you'll find a similar story centuries ago. The, the southwestern Malaysian city of Malacca which gave the strait its name, was once one of the world's busiest ports. Merchants brought tea from China, opium from India, jewelry from Burma, and Islam from the Middle East. From the 16th to 19th centuries, Malacca also dominated the global spice trade, which would trigger a series of European interventions. Merchants during those times handled a wide variety of goods, but one thing not carried on their ships was oil. And today, significant amounts of the, ener of the world's energy needs pass through the Malacca Strait, the exact numbers are debatable, and I defer to our speakers for accurate figures, but some sources contend that half the world's energy needs pass through the Malacca Strait each year, including 80% of the oil needs of nations in Northeast Asia. Now today, some fear for the safe transport of these energy needs through the Strait. Piracy is a concern, and has been for a long time. Legend has it that Marco Polo, while sailing back uh, to Italy after his time in Kublai Khan's court, was besieged by pirates in the Strait of Malacca and lost all but 18 of the 600 people in his shipping convoy. Now today, and especially since 9-11, there's also concern about terrorism. Some commentators paint alarming pictures of pirates teaming with terrorists to ignite massive oil spills or to blow up oil tankers, closing the strait and imperiling the global oil supply. Other experts, however, claim that these threat scenarios are exaggerated. Now, this afternoon, our, uh, our intent is to make a measured assessment of energy security in the very strategic Strait of Malacca. And today's program will be guided by four uh, general questions. One, what is the waterway's geopolitical importance and which nations have the most at stake? Two, what is truly the current likelihood of terrorism in the Strait? Three, what is the impact on environmental uh, resources? And four, what can be done to enhance security in the Malacca Strait? And today, we're very fortunate to be joined by uh, four very distinguished speakers. All have interrupted extremely busy schedules, and some have traveled quite far. And for that, we're extremely grateful. Um, so anyway, why don't we get started now? Uh, you should have in front of you a sheet with biographical info on the speakers. So I'll be brief as I introduce each speaker. We'll start to my right and work to my left. Um, our first speaker today is Michael Herberg, who is Director of the Asian Energy Security and Globalization Programs at the National Bureau of Asian Research, NBR. Previously, he directed the Asia Pacific Energy and Environment Program at the University of California, San Diego, and he's also held a variety of positions with ARCO. His publications include the chapter, Asia's Energy Insecurity, Cooperation or Conflict, in the NBR volume, Strategic Asia 2004-05, Confronting Terrorism in the Pursuit of Power. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Michael. I appreciate that. And uh, it's really nice to be here. I'm honored by the invitation to speak to such a sophisticated group and be in a panel of such, uh, 
such uh, expert uh, people to talk about these issues. Um, if I squint, it's because my glasses were smashed on a plane last night, so I can't see anything. <laughs> Luckily, I can see the slides here, but it luck <laughs> if I had to read them very far, I'd be in deep trouble. Um, what I'd like to do is just spend a little bit of time sketching out the broad geopolitical parameters of the energy issue uh, as it pertains to the Malacca Straits. Uh, to just give you some magnitudes, put some boundaries around what's at stake, who are the key players here and why, uh, and some of the critical questions. And just really as briefly as I can, uh, and hopefully we have some time for Q&A, that's always, always a lot more fun. Just to, 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 to set the stage, you know, it's, it's uh, probably the understatement of the week that energy has become a key factor in Asia's geopolitical architecture. What I call energy nationalism, uh, focused on rising prices, the perception of long-term scarcity. Uh, you have all the Asian states perceiving themselves to be competing for supplies around the world of oil, and increasingly uh, natural gas and LNG are falling into that, uh, into that problem as well. Uh, and it's driven by $70 oil prices, the sense of scarcity, uh, and status regimes and uh, uh, economics in Asia. So you have this kind of zero-sum uh, mentality, and transport routes play into that as well, control over transport routes, uh, because so much of Asia's oil and increasingly natural gas are coming not just through the straits, but through the sea lanes of Southeast Asia. Uh, and the focus is intensifying. As I said, it's mainly oil, but as time goes on, natural gas, LNG are, are falling into that same uh, set of issues. Just some broad uh, parameters here. This shows you total world interregional trade uh, in oil, gas, and coal. The first stack being 2002, the second stack in each case being 2030. And you can see by those yellow bars, particularly in oil, how much of the world's oil trade currently, uh, how much of the world's oil consumption is traded globally, and how that's going to increase substantially over the next 25 or 30 years. This is oil and gas, uh, to some extent, moving longer distance through more choke points with more vulnerabilities, more issues related to it. Uh, so this is not just an Asian phenomenon, it's a global phenomenon of energy trade. So what are the energy stakes uh, in, in the Straits? And, and I think it's, although this conference is clearly about the Malacca Straits, and the other speakers will talk more specifically about that. In energy terms, Malacca Straits to me is kind of a, a, a code word for the sea lanes. Because as many of you know, you know, tankers, you can bypass the Malacca Straits, the Lombok Straits, the Sunda Straits. Uh, it means a lot more steaming time for shipping. Uh, but uh, you can go around it. Now, there's not enough shipping capacity to absorb all that, so prices would rise drastically if you had a, a problem in the, in the Straits. Uh, insurance rates would rise. It, it would be a major price event if you did have a closure, even if you can go around it, because it absorbs so much more shipping capacity when you have to do all that extra steaming time that that in itself will create a huge problem. But I think the larger context to have in mind here is the sea lanes of South Asia and, and East Asia, along with the Malacca Strait. So it's choke points. But to the players out there, energy-wise, it's control of the sea lanes really is the, is the issue that, that people are, are, are highly motivated on, uh, the, the highest level of angst and increasingly the highest level of nationalism. Uh, just to give you some, some metrics, and I'll show you some, some more graphics to, to, to bring this home. Uh, in terms of oil, in 2002, 11 million barrels of oil a day moved through the Straits of Malacca, through the Indian Ocean. Uh, most of that from the Persian Gulf, but a lot of that from Africa, moving to Japan, Korea, China, Taiwan, uh, across Southeast Asia. That's headed for 22 million barrels a day, doubling by 2030, according to the, the, the 2004. IEA World uh, Energy Outlook that's probably somewhat higher now. Uh, so that's rising from roughly a half of Asia's total oil consumption to two-thirds of ta Asia's total oil consumption coming through the Straits of Malacca or the, or the sea lanes. LNG, these numbers aren't going to make a lot of sense to you, just let me say they're big numbers <laughs> uh, in terms of LNG trade and, and natural gas. 29 billion cubic meters moved through the Straits of LNG in 2002. You can see that's heading to 114 BCM by 2030. Uh, and 
And the interesting thing about that, and I'll show you some maps that kind of bring this home, uh, is that, an, and this is why the sea lanes are important, is that not a, 114 BCM will be moving strictly through the Straits from Africa and Persian Gulf, but you have another 114 uh, which will be moving through the South China Free Sea from other Southeast Asian sources, Australia, Indonesia, Malaysia primarily. So all of this, you know, this is, accounts to about 80% of the LNG flowing to Northeast Asia uh, will be coming through the sea lanes, either the Malacca Straits and or the South China Sea. So uh, these, these straits and the sea lanes do loom extremely large in the movement of, of these large supplies of oil. This shows you the IEA's uh, long-term estimates uh, re reflecting some of the numbers I just showed you. But if you look over at the Straits of Malacca, 11 million barrels of oil a day uh, that in the round circle there, that represented 14% of total world oil demand moving through the Straits. And this is kind of uh, in the vein of what we were talking about earlier. Uh, not half the world's energy supplies don't move through the Straits of Malacca, but it's, it's a lot. Uh, by 2030, 20% of the entire world oil demand base will be moving through the Straits of Malacca, uh, that second pink bar there. Uh, and that's 22 million barrels of oil a day, which is the number I talked to you about. To give you some metrics, that 11 million today is roughly a quarter of the world's traded oil, and traded by moving across borders. Most oil, you know, half the world's oil production is consumed domestically in the country it's produced. 40 roughly a million barrels a day is traded globally. So you've got already got 25% of the world's traded oil moving through the Straits. Uh, if you go out to 2030, 22 million barrels will represent roughly 40% of the world's traded oil moving through the Straits of Malacca. So these are, these are big numbers and major flows of energy. This shows you, and I won't go through this, is just a, a schematic on LNG, global LNG movements. Uh, and you can see the, the large, the, the blue uh, lines going from the Persian Gulf out to Asia. Those, although they show overland, those are uh, LNG tankers moving through the Straits, the uh, Indian Ocean, the South China Sea. And you can see by the larger lines that today the larger share of LNG moving to Northeast Asia comes out of Southeast Asia. Uh, this, this is kind of a complicated slide. I won't, I won't work too hard on it. I would just focus down on the bottom three lines there uh, of, the, of the chart or table. We go from 2002 to 2030. Uh, and as you can see from 2002, LNG moving from the Persian Gulf through the Malacca Straits to uh, Asia are going to rise fourfold from 29 BCM to 114, reflecting the numbers I showed you earlier. Uh, but also Southeast Asia roughly doubling its flow of LNG to Northeast Asia uh, over that period of time. And the only non-tankered uh, LNG that's not flowing through the sea lanes to Northeast Asia uh, is expected to be by pipeline from Russia. But you've still got 80 plus percent of, of Asian LNG moving through these sea lanes. So th these are critical, critical volumes. Now some of the geopolitics of this briefly, and I'll, I'll uh, leave some of the rest of this to the others. This takes you down the list. Who are the key players and what are their particular interests in this energy side? The U.S. is the dominant player. We control the sea lanes, the Pacific Command. This is a fact of life on the ground or on the water uh, out in Asia and all the way around to the Persian Gulf. Uh, that's a well-known story. U.S. doesn't get any of its oil flowing from or LNG. We don't get very little LNG flowing through that area. Our interest is the uninterrupted flow of oil and gas to Asia and to the world market. Uh, it would be a disaster for the U.S. economy to have a cutoff of the flow through those sea lanes for obvious reasons, price spikes, dislocations in the economy. So, so our interest, above and beyond our natural st uh, security interests, and there's a whole range of those, obviously, but in energy terms, our interest is in maintaining the free flow continued flow of oil and gas through the straits and the, and the sea lanes of Southeast Asia. Indonesia, Malaysia, the literal states, uh, they send some oil, each of them, north to uh, Northeast Asia. Uh, but I think their larger issues are in the sovereignty issues 
And they are obviously, and many of you probably know, very sensitive to the U.S. role in the sea lanes in the, in the Malacca Straits. Uh, several years ago, Admiral Fargo from Pacific Command uh, suggested, a, I believe he called a maritime security initiative where the U.S. would help out the Southeast Asians to patrol the Malacca Straits. Uh, he was, uh, <laughs> and I've talked to him personally, uh, he was roundly rebuked and uh, uh, the U.S. was told in no, no uh, uh, uneven terms that we were not welcome uh, doing that. I mean, that may be an overstatement, but uh, it clearly provoked the notions of sovereignty among the literal states. And the U.S. since then has been trying to find a way to, 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 uh, to find a way to have a bigger role out there. Japan, 90 percent, 90 plus percent of its oil supplies come through that, that, uh, those sea lanes and 40 to 50 percent of their total LNG supplies. And remember, Japan, LNG is the, virtually their entire natural gas supply. So this is 40 to 50 percent of their entire natural gas system uh, moving through there. Japan has a very strong, uh, powerful navy, but obviously uh, with a very limited role and they stay very close to coastal defense. But push comes to shove, Japan has a very serious uh, navy. At least that's what I'm told. It's not my, my expertise. China, I'll talk about a little bit more in a minute, became a net oil importer in t 1993. Today imports about 40 percent of its oil needs, 40, 45 total of its total oil needs is imported, 30 percent plus of its total oil needs or 75 or 80 percent of its oil imports come through the South China Sea, Straits of Malacca from Africa and the Persian Gulf. Uh, and in the long run, if you go out 10, 15 years, 60 percent of its total oil needs are going to be coming through the Straits uh, and the sea lanes. So critical looming issue for China, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Singapore, very capable Navy, a literal state, uh, much more interested, willing to see U.S. play a role in, in patrolling the Straits. Uh, and, but I'll leave these issues to some of the others because uh, it's really out of my lane, so to speak, uh, in terms of expertise. And even India is ga getting uh, focused on the, uh, looking east, the Malacca Straits, its influence in Southeast Asia. And I think there the real issue is the rivalry with China. As China seeks to, to project some sort of naval presence, uh, we don't want to push that too hard, into the South Asian uh, realm, uh, and I'll talk about that in a second. That provokes, obviously, instantly Indian reactions to Chinese uh, uh, reach into South Asia. And all of this kind of geopolitics tends to over the strategic mistrust overlays the energy mistrust uh, between these states. China, I'll focus on for a second. For China, there's a, a whole series of issues, but probably the one that trumps the others is simply the fear of U.S. dominance of the sea lanes. This comes to the fore most clearly in their concerns that the U.S. would cut off their oil flow or their oil import flow in, during a Taiwan confrontation. This looms very large on the, on the, on the screen of strategic thinkers in, in, in China in a Taiwan scenario. Uh, so the, the fact that it uh, has to rely on U.S. control of those sea lanes is not a comfortable situation with China, but in the near term it has very little it can do about that. Uh, but terrorism, piracy are also increasingly important concerns for them because, you know, a really rapidly escalating share of their oil and gas uh, and eventually natural gas will come through there. They don't, let, they don't have the blue water uh, naval power projection capability, and it's going to be a long time before they have that. Uh, so they're free riding, in effect, uh, on the U.S. at this point, uh, this, this period. So what's their response been and these are the string of pearls notion some of you may have have heard the notion that china's accessing setting up naval basing access on a series of ports along the indian ocean starting from hainan island around through the straits and into all the way around to to uh, the port of gawadar in uh, pakistan the notion is it's a string of pearls where they would be able to uh, refuel potentially reach out and threaten shipping in that region in extremis in the case of a confrontation with Taiwan. This is a controversial notion. I don't want to push it too hard. Uh, but uh, certainly they are doing those kinds of things, port access, working out agreements with Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, Cambodia, uh, Myanmar, working out arrangements to, uh, to, to be able to operate in, in a very distant naval environment uh, in, in the, uh, South Asia. Also, a, 
a heavy focus on submarine upgrading. Uh, and that's another dimension of something that would, when you get down to, to oil and LNG tanker shipping, submarines are a major league uh, uh, weapon against those kinds of flows. So it depends on how you want to read Chinese intentions on that. There's lots of other reasons for what they're doing, not just energy, so I don't want to blow that out of proportion. Um, clearly, they're moving towards blue water Navy development long term, but that's a 30 to 40 year process. So uh, if any of you from the Pentagon, uh, I understand that, that the annual reports are concerned about Chinese military development, but uh, you know, it seems like a long way off. Uh, and energy isn't the, the, the only uh, issue there. They're also working on alternative routes, uh, talking about an oil pipeline up through Myanmar, which would bypass having to push that oil through the straits. Uh, they're also talking about a pipeline from Pakistan up through Pakistan from Gwadar, in theory, to China. But that's a long, long way to go. So uh, these are stretches. But they're looking at all the options that they can because they're very worried about this enormous slug of their oil supplies that are going to be coming through the south, the sea lanes, over the next 25 years. Uh, it's gone so far that they want to build their own Chinese tanker fleet, oil tanker fleet. Uh, with the sense that it's more secure oil if it's put on Chinese tankers. Uh, I've argued with them, in fact, that makes it more insecure if you're worried about a Taiwan scenario because uh, they're easier to identify and, it's, in theory, easier to take out a Chinese tanker with Chinese oil or interdict it than it is a Saudi tanker carrying oil, Saudi oil to China. A very different uh, uh, set of problems. Uh, so they are interested in some role in patrolling the Straits in the future and in reducing U.S. control of the sea lanes in that area. But it's a long time before, in my view, and what I, everybody that, uh, that I talk with, that's going to be a serious uh, threat to U.S. interests. So just to kind of pull it together here, uh, you know, as prices rise, you know, the geopolitics of this will f increasingly focus attention on these sea lanes and the Malacca Straits. Uh, so I think if we assume prices are high and going to stay high for quite a while, this focus of these countries is going to continue to intensify on this stretch of sea lanes. Uh, there's no threat to U.S. dominance of the sea lanes anytime soon. So I would think uh, what the rest of the panel will talk about much is the terrorism piracy, which I think is the real near-term uh, set of issues of concern. Uh, but I think in the long, very long run, you know, the rise of China, these what people call asymmetrical strategies to impact shipping through these sea lanes in extremis in the case of a confrontation, uh, they're kind of wild cards, I, w I would suggest, in the long, long term. Uh, and you, you certainly have the U.S., India, and Japan sitting warily watching this process, uh, wondering how quickly China is going to move in this direction. Uh, and, and in some cases, I think, seeing threats where they don't really exist. But uh, China, in, in, in many ways, is kind of, I think, a long-term wild card. So I think with that, I'll just close, and uh, uh, we hopefully we'll have a chance to talk at Q&A about some of these other issues. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that very, uh, very good uh, overview. Let's move on to our second speaker now. It's uh, Catherine Zara Raymond, <coughs> who is a uh, Singapore-based analyst with Control Risks, an independent risk consultancy. Previously, she was Associate Research Fellow with the Maritime Security Program of the Institute of Defense and Strategic Studies in Singapore. <coughs> she uh, has co-edited the book, Best of Times, Worst of Times, Maritime Security in the Asia-Pacific, which was published last year. And she's now uh, writing a chapter on piracy in the Malacca Strait for a U.S. Naval War College publication. So whenever she's ready, you are ready. Okay. The floor uh, is yours. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, could I also just say thank you to uh, Michael and the Woodrow Wilson Center for inviting me here today from Singapore. Um, and if I look a bit tired, it's because it's currently 4 o'clock in the morning in Singapore. Um, I'm going to today give uh, an overview of the challenges in uh, the Malacca Strait to maritime security. Um, in the wake of 9-11, uh, as Michael was talking about, uh, the vulnerability of the maritime sector increasingly came under the spotlight of governments and the media. 
in Southeast Asia, the issue attracted a lot of attention for a number of reasons. And as Mike has just demonstrated, uh, one of them is that the region is home to the world's, one of the world's most strategically important waterways, the Malacca Straits. Uh, it's also home to the world's second largest port of Singapore. In addition, piracy has been endemic in the region uh, and in the region's waterways for centuries. And um, at, uh, sort of in the year 2000, had reached worryingly high levels. Also, a number of terrorist groups are known to operate in the region and have maritime capability. As a result of this increased attention, over the last few years, various scenarios have been put forward by the media and academics alike of how terrorists might carry out an attack in, say, for example, the Malacca Straits. Speculation has uh, been made also about the um, possibility of a terrorism and piracy nexus so in other words, the joining forces of pirates and terrorists to carry out a devastating attack on world sh or on shipping. Also, there's currently evidence, uh, or sorry, although there's little evidence to suggest that this is actually taking place, statements are already being made that suggest a blurring of the lines between piracy and terrorism. And as a consequence, the threat of piracy is being in some, in some situations misunderstood and also exaggerated. So in my presentation, what I want to do is uh, to first provide an accurate overview of the phenomenon of piracy in the Malacca Straits, including an assessment of the current trends, which will hopefully put into perspective the threat posed by piracy to ships transiting the Straits. And then secondly, what I want to do is discuss the threat posed by terrorism to shipping in the waterway uh, through an examination of the capability of some of the terrorist groups operating in the region um, and the opportunities for them to do so. The discussion of the, terrorist, uh, of the terrorist groups will be structured around a number of scenarios which have, feat have featured heavily um, in the media and in academic publications. So moving on now just to piracy. Uh, due to time constraints, I don't have time to go in to a lot of background information regarding piracy in Southeast Asia, but I just want to sum up a few of the main developments. Uh, piracy has been an almost constant feature of the region uh, for centuries, and by the year 2000, as I said, we were seeing very high levels of piracy taking, uh, pirate attacks taking place in the waterway. Uh, and in the year 2000, there were actually 75 attacks um, in the Malacca Straits in that year. For a number of reasons, piracy has generally been declining. Uh, the tsunami, which took a devastating toll um, on the region in 2004, probably causing the deaths of many of those involved in piracy or damaging or destroying their equipment may have contributed to this decline. Despite the decreasing incidence of piracy in the waterway, the Joint War Committee in 2005 added the waterway to its list of areas um, of, uh, sort of under threat from terrorist attack, its war risk list. Um, this caused a massive outcry from the littoral states. However, when the incidence of piracy fell to an all-time low in the first seven months of 2006, uh, the uh, Malacca Straits was removed from the war risk list. And in this chart here, uh, you can see that the Malacca Straits now takes up a very small portion of that chart. So moving, now, moving on now, I just want to talk about the main piracy trends that my analysis has revealed. In this slide, you can see the actual location of successful attacks over the last five years. So bear in mind here, though, that 60,000 ships, or over 60,000 ships, transit the Malacca Straits on an annual basis. And even when the rates of piracy were at their highest, uh, the proportion of ships being attacked was actually less than 0.1%. But so you can see the, uh, the main areas of um, piracy, which are in or near the Indonesian port, so for example, the port of Belawan, uh, in the international waters at the northern end of the Malacca Straits, and then off Malacca in the southern end of the Malacca Straits. And then there were also some attacks in the Philip Channel, off Singapore, and in the western approaches to that channel. And then finally, uh, in the area east of Bintan Island, uh, there were some attacks as well. So in this uh, chart, you can see the main types of attacks on ships taking place in the straits. And what's quite clear uh, by, this, by the figures is that the most common type of attack taking place is robbery. 
the more sophisticated attacks involving kidnapping or hijacking, while they receive a lot more attention in the media, they actually take place relatively rarely compared to things like robbery. Uh, although you can actually see that there was an increase in kidnapper ransom attacks in 2004-2005 relative to the other types. The vessels targeted in the more sophisticated attacks are pro pr predominantly smaller vessels. Of the 31 recorded incidents of kidnap during the period, only five were on vessels over 1,000 GRT. Of the 20 vessels hijacked, 16 were small, mainly fishing vessels or tugs, the other four were product tankers of over 1,000 GRT, and they were probably hijacked as part of an organized crime, um, or uh, as part of organized crime, with the objective of stealing the cargo for the sale on the black market. So here you can see the actual routes taken by vessels uh, in the Malacca Straits. The vessels on local voyages would follow the thin black lines, and uh, those on international voyages would take the thick black line through the middle. In terms of targets, it's the vessels on local voyages that are generally more at risk in Southeast Asia. Um, and this is probably due to their smaller size, their smaller crews, they have a lower freeboard, and also their location. So in other words, they're perhaps traveling closer to the coast or away from areas of higher shipping traffic. <coughs> Vessels used mainly for local voyages are small bulk carriers, small product tankers, and general cargo ships. Even the, the vessels that are on international voyages, which are attacked, again, tend to be the smaller vessels. Larger tankers and cargo carrying vessels on international voyages are not attacked unless they slow down or stop for some reason. And these vessels are also more likely to be taking all the precautions recommended by the IMO and the Ship Owners Associations. So the final chart that I want to show you is the trends in type of weapons being used in attacks over the last 10 years. What the slide shows is actually the most lethal weapon used in each attack. So it might actually look like the knives are being replaced by uh, small arms. But what in fact is happening is that small arms are appearing alongside knives in attacks. Um, contrary to popular belief that pirates are now armed to the teeth with automatic weapons, making them no different from terrorists, you can see that the use of automatic weapons, um, represented by the yellow line, has not significantly increased over the last few years. So to sum up, from my findings, it would seem that the chances of a large vessel on an international voyage through the Malacca Straits being attacked is very low. Uh, the vessels most at risk of being attacked are the smaller ships on local voyages or those stopping in high-risk Indonesian ports. Um, and these vessels would tend to be tugs, fishing boats, and small tankers. And my findings also suggest that pirates are not becoming increasingly well-armed uh, or using more sophisticated weapons. So moving on now um, to maritime terrorism, there are a number of terrorist groups operating in Southeast Asia, but I'm just going to talk about a few uh, which would perhaps be the most likely perpetrators of a, t a terrorist attack in the Malacca Straits. The Moro Islamic Liberation Front and Abu Sayyaf Group, both of which are separatist groups active in the Philippines, have carried out previous maritime uh, terrorist attacks. ASG is based on Bazan Island, the group has been responsible for abducting foreign nationals and holding them to ransom, bombings, and assassinations. It's also made threats against the global petroleum industry. Most of its attacks have been conducted around the Sulu and Celeb Sea, but it's also conducted attacks in East Malaysia and in Kalimantan in Indonesia. One of ASG's most spectacular and devastating attacks, I'm sure you've all heard about, was the Super Ferry 14 incident in which 100 people were killed. Since the late 1990s, MILF uh, has been in peace negotiations with the Philippine government, but the talks have been punctuated by outbreaks of violence on both sides. The MILF has mounted attacks against both military and civilian targets, and the group has been accused of attacks against Philippine shipping, and in particular against domestic inter-island ferries. The Jemaya Islamia Network, or JI, um, Following the arrests of JI operatives in Singapore in 2001, it was revealed that the group had planned to attack visiting U.S. naval warships in the region. 
Furthermore, there's evidence of cooperation between JI, MILF and ASG in terms of the smuggling of weapons and people and supplies using the maritime domain. And it's also been reported that JI has sent recruits for training in the Philippines. So bearing in mind that there are groups operating in Southeast Asia with varying levels of capability, maritime capability, and perhaps the capacity to further expand this capability should they choose to. Uh, and there's also evidence of a desire by some of the groups to carry out an attack on Western or US maritime interests in the region. I now want to examine some of the ways in which uh, they could possibly carry out an attack in the Malacca Straits. The first scenario is um, sinking a ship to block the Straits of Malacca. In an article in Singapore's major broadsheet newspaper, The Straits Times, in 2004, an expert on maritime security is quoted as saying that if terrorists want to mount a maritime strike here in, the, in uh, Southeast Asia, Sinking a ship in the Malacca Straits is the likely attack of choice. He goes on to say that it would enable them to wreak economic havoc worldwide by blocking the sea lane, and it's also the easiest way to attack. However, um, in my opinion, I think this would be impossible for one main reason. Um, basically, the narrowest point of the March Channel in the Malacca Straits is at one fathom bank. And here, the width of the channel is 0.6 nautical miles wide. Even if a ship was sunk at this point, which is in itself not a very easy task to uh, accomplish, it wouldn't actually block the Malacca Straits from one shore to another. Ships would continue to use the waterway by navigating around the sunken vessel, perhaps having to go outside the March Channel. And admittedly, some larger vessels might have to reroute uh, say, around the Lombok or the Sunda Straits, but the majority of vessels um, would still be able to navigate through the Malacca Straits. So um, the passenger shipping certainly wouldn't be blocked. The second scenario that I want to talk about is the um, possibility of terrorists hijacking, say, a large LNG tanker and blowing it up in a port, say, such as Singapore, um, having a severe impact on global trade. And this scenario seems all more, or seemed all more probable, probable because of the stories circulating in the media that pirates were hijacking huge tankers carrying high-risk cargoes on a frequent basis. There are a number of issues related to this scenario that uh, should be considered when assessing how likely it would be and what particular form an attack like this could take. Firstly, the differing capacity of each vessel and its cargo to cause damage and the means by which this could be made possible by determined terrorists. Second is the actual impact on the port or facility itself. LNG tankers and their potential role in this scenario uh, have probably received the most attention, so I'm going to focus my discussion on them. Uh, in its liquid state, natural gas is not actually explosive, and it's in this state that it's shipped in large quantities via refrigerated tankers. Once in the open air, LNG quickly evaporates. Um, if the conditions are right, a highly combustible cloud will form. And if ignited, the resulting fire uh, would be pretty much impossible to extinguish, and it would burn until all its fuel was gone. The impact of a fire on a port, say Singapore, would obviously be considerable. Uh, there would be loss of life and severe structural damage in the immediate area. Um, and this would mean that the port would have to operate at a reduced capacity, causing severe delays and a loss of business. The difficulty is that terrorists would need to create an explosion on board the vessel as it's rammed into the target and in order to rupture the hull uh, and allow the gas to escape. And however, the force create, uh, required to breach the hull and the tank would most certainly produce a fire at the tank location and this would ignite the gas as it escaped, rather than causing a cloud of fire or a plume. So the potential damage would be limited somewhat to the tanker's location. It can't be denied that there are many high-risk cargoes transported by sea today that do have a great destructive capacity under the correct conditions. However, it's in creating these conditions that would present a considerable challenge to any would-be maritime terrorist. Given the plethora of more accessible targets on land, uh, I, in my opinion, at this time, um, I think that targets uh, that terrorists 
are unlikely to target vessels carrying high-risk cargoes and use them as floating bombs to strike ports. The next scenario um, hasn't received much attention, um, but um, there, and there are two variations, and both of them are equally alarming. The first is that terrorists could mine the straits, and the authorities would be alerted to this fact, either by a declaration from the perpetrators or because a ship hits a mine. The second version is that terrorists just claim to have mined the straits and simulate a mine attack on a ship to add credibility to their claim. In each scenario, assuming that there's little or no information on the exact area of the straits that has been mined, the impact would be the same. The Malacca Straits would be closed to shipping traffic, forcing vessels, particularly those on international voyages, to reroute around the Lombok and Sunda Straits. This would cause severe delays to shipping, as the alternative routes are longer, and the shipping costs would increase, and world trade would be affected. The impact on the region's economies could be severe if the closure lasted more than a few days. The response by the literal states would be to ensure that the straits were declared, as sa declared safe as soon as possible, and there would be immense international pressure for them to do this quickly. It's most likely that assistance would be offered by other nations, although in the past the literal states have been keen to limit international involvement in the waterway. The ability of the littoral states to achieve this task without assistance is questionable given that some of the countries are limited in their mine clearing capability. Without external assistance, clearing a narrow channel through the waterway would take two or three weeks, uh, and total clearance would obviously be even longer. If outside assistance was accepted, it would still take a few days to clear a narrow channel, and possibly longer if the international vessels were not immediately available. So to sum up, it would seem that blocking the straits with a sunken vessel or blowing up a large LNG tanker in a port such as Singapore would seem less likely and certainly a lot harder to carry out than, say, a fake sea mine uh, scare or even one scenario which I haven't mentioned yet, which is a small boat attack. And in fact, in my opinion, I think it's this latter type of attack which poses the greatest threat to shipping in the straits. This attack is probably the most simple to carry out in terms of expertise and equipment. It's also been used in the past by Al-Qaeda, uh, first in the attack on the USS Cole in 2000, and then on the Limburg in 2002. And furthermore, this attack is probably the most difficult to prevent. The last issue that I want to talk about is the possibility of a terrorism piracy nexus which has over the last few years featured prominently in regional maritime security debates. There was a concern that terrorists could exploit the maritime knowledge and expertise of the pirates in order to carry out a devastating attack on regional shipping. However, it could be argued that uh, it's unlikely that the small-scale pirates which perpetrate the majority of the attacks in the region would want to cooperate with terrorist groups such as J.I., uh, firstly, there's probably a lack of ideological affinity with such ex extremist groups on the part of the pirates who are financially rather than ideologically or politically motivated. Secondly, this brand of pirate, uh, many, whom, many of whom are thought to be Indonesian, living in coastal settlements, is unlikely to want to draw attention to its activities, which have provided a valuable source of income for generations. Engaging in a cooperative uh, relationship with terrorist groups and aiding in their attacks would most certainly uh, invite a heavy-handed response and the immediate clampdown on uh, their activities. In addition, from the perspective of terrorists, of the terrorist groups, there may be an unwillingness to involve pirates in their activities due to the fact that, uh, particularly in the case of J.I., they traditionally recruit their operatives um, through or based on kinship ties. So, for example, the members will often be siblings or related by marriage. So, therefore, cooperating with unknown individuals would probably be deemed uh, risky. While the uh, terrorism piracy nexus in the strict sense would seem unlikely, cooperation between ASG, MILF, and JI is already suspected to be taking place, as I mentioned before, um, particularly in terms of the smuggling of weapons, people, and supplies. It's also been reported that J.I. has sent recruits for training in the Philippines, as I said. Um, so there's therefore a real possibility that ASG could share its piratical ac uh, expertise with J.I., significantly increasing the latter's maritime capability. 
Another relationship which is also significant in this context is that which reportedly exists between some Philippine pirate groups and ASG, that is, that uh, ASG has in the past purchased hostages from independent pirate groups. And while this limited form of cooperation is not that which is implied in the more uh, narrow conception of a pirate, pirate piracy terrorism nexus, and it might not all, uh, apply to all perpetrators of piracy, it nevertheless shows that contrary to popular opinion, pirates might, might be willing to cooperate with terrorists, provided that the financial incentive was substantial. So in conclusion then, um, I hope that my brief overview of the maritime security challenges in the Malacca Straits, uh, or in my brief overview, that I've been able to some extent to put into perspective the threats from piracy and maritime terrorism, as it's only through an accurate understanding of these threats that we can hope to uh, tailor our countermeasures to effectively combat them. And I, I hope I've also shown that pirates and terrorists are still distinguishable as different phenomena, and that while there may have been occasional uh, cooperation between ASG and some Philippine pirate groups, there is still little evidence to suggest that there is a blurring of the lines between piracy and terrorism. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for that. Let's move on to our third speaker this afternoon, David Rosenberg, who is a professor of political science at Middlebury College. Uh, he's also editor of the South China Sea World Wide Web Virtual Library, which is an online resource for issues of regional development, the environment, and security in the South China Sea. And uh, he's now at work on an article dealing with the international relations of the South China Sea. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you for uh, bringing us all together from all over the world to discuss this issue from a variety of different perspectives. Uh, the topic of this talk is safety, security, and environment in the Straits of Malacca and Singapore. And I'm going to rely as much as possible on some visual information. And here before you, you can see what I think is a snapshot of the problems and prospects for achieving safety and security and, uh, and environmental protection in this region. The one on the left is indicative of the problems. Uh, first of all, it's rather overcast with smoke haze, which is fairly uh, dense at the moment and has had uh, a constant uh, influence on a lot of uh, transboundary pollution issues. In the foreground are a bunch of uh, fishing vessels. Uh, this is a very important area for fisheries. Uh, it employs a lot of people. People rely on fish for a major source of protein. Uh, it's a major uh, route for uh, northern bluefin tuna uh, migrations. In the background is an oil tanker. Uh, and all of these factors are exacerbating, increasing in the same place. That's a snapshot of the problem. The one on the right is a snapshot of the prospects of what can be done and is being done in one place. Perhaps you may recognize this. I took this from the top floor balcony of a Rasa Sentosa Resort in Singapore. There's a lovely lagoon pool and uh, palms. This is a very extensive beachfront hotel uh, resort uh, facility in Singapore, widely used by Singaporeans as well as some international visitors. All of that is, is not really the remarkable thing about it. It's what's in the background that is also remarkable. You can see a steady stream of tankers, of container ships, bulk carriers, all the time. And I was just fascinated to watch all of this going on. And every once in a while, I'd go jump in the water to refresh myself and make believe this, this all could happen, in one place at least, um, <clears throat> uh, that uh, makes at least some hope for something similar in, throughout the whole region. What's driving all these changes? We've already heard a little bit about this uh, from Michael. Uh, energy use, energy consumption, and here you can see uh, a somewhat different version of the same data presented by Michael, and I'll just emphasize again, over here, this is Northeast Asia, and this pink line here is China. By the year 2030, as indicated before, its total consumption 
of uh, energy will exceed that of the U.S. and Canada. Superimposed on the bottom over here is Japan and Korea. Over here is East Asia, which uh, Peter Drysdale means Southeast Asia, <coughs> uh, amounts to a big increase in oil consumption throughout the region. And a lot of it, certainly not all, will go through the Strait of Malacca. How it goes through the Strait of Malacca uh, deserves some very careful attention. And this uh, breaks down some of the data already presented by uh, Michael and Zara of types of vessels over time. Each bar represents a year from 1999 to, the, to 2005. Over here in the, is the total. You can see they're all going up pretty much except for last year. Actually went down a little. That's a little bit deceptive. While the number of ships went down, the size composition of ships changed. Look over here, the first three columns are VLCCs, very large crude carriers, then plain old crude carriers, crude carriers, excuse me, and then LNG LPG carriers. There's actually a drop, substantial drop in the number of, of um, uh, crude tankers, but a substantial increase in the VLCCs. Much bigger ships are, are increasing in number throughout the region. Another important thing to note, in this conference here, where we emphasize energy so much, is the reverse flow of manufactured goods in container ships. And they're over here. And this year, or excuse me, 2005, I believe, the number of container ships exceeded the number, going west mostly, uh, sur surpassed the number of tankers going east. Uh, one of the consequences of that has to do with size. Again, you can't build ports fast enough, but you can build bigger and bigger ships, oil tankers, as we've just seen, and now uh, uh, container ships as well. China is planning to build uh, a couple of these 9,800 TEUs, 20-foot equivalent unit uh, ships, <coughs> uh, to carry their manufactured goods to their markets. Um, there is also an enormous amount of regional trade going on that we should examine a little bit more closely as well. This lists the 10 top container ports in the world over the past three years. Just container ports. Uh, and reading from left to right, that's uh, Singapore, which is now up here, <coughs> with uh, somewhere around 23 million uh, containers handled. Then Hong Kong, Shanghai, Shenzhen, Busan, Kaohsiung, Rotterdam, Hamburg, Dubai, and Los Angeles, Long Beach. The big increases are over here in Shanghai, which uh, opened a new deep water port facility. <clears throat> and uh, we may see some different uh, estimates for next year. Uh, this indicates uh, another important phenomenon worth noting, is that is not only is interregional trade growing rapidly, 20 to 25 percent per year between East Asia and Europe or East Asia and Africa or other places, but intra-regional trade is growing even faster. And these are the major hubs that are redirecting a lot of the shipments within Northeast Asia and Southeast Asia. All, uh, many of them trying to squeeze through the Strait of Malacca, yet another picture of this very busy waterway indicating some of the hot spots. Um, Zahra's overlay map of the past five years would really be great with some uh, chronological animations to see how things change over time. I think that pirates are remarkably uh, flexible and moving around to where the opportunities present themselves uh, to uh, find some, some way to, to uh, grab a cargo. Uh, these are um, several choke points, perhaps the narrowest one is over here, um, westbound lane of, uh, near Buffalo Rock, uh, 530 meters wide, depth is about 20 meters. So that's a, a major series of choke points for all that growing traffic east and west, tankers and containers going back and forth. Uh, let me just pause here for a second to make a few basic points about basic priorities of different user groups, of different stakeholders, let's say. Uh, I've divided them into three groups, 
what I would call the user states, the international shipping states in particular, Japan, United States, and perhaps we should include China in this as well, the coastal states, Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia, and other stakeholders, especially the, the uh, shipping companies, and uh, international agencies, some that represent shippers, others uh, that are related to the United Nations. I think the most fundamental distinction is between the international uh, user states and coastal states. Uh, the countries with major shipping interests and naval interests, such as the U.S. and Japan, mainly want freedom of navigation through the straits uh, and the related sea lanes for their, not only their oil tankers and container ships, but also for their naval vessels. Remember, the headquarters for the U.S. Pacific Command is in Hawaii, and their major deployments these days are west of the Strait of Malacca in the Persian Gulf. The coastal states, those with extensive coastlines on the Strait of Malacca, they want to protect their relatively recent sovereign rights over exclusive economic zones and territorial waters throughout this area, and in particular to protect those areas not only for their own national sovereignty, but for its uh, intrinsic resources, recreation, tourism, fisheries that I've already mentioned. One notable exception to this categorization is Singapore. It is a coastal state, although it doesn't have much of a coastline, but it certainly thrives and survives on its ability to provide services uh, to the shipping industry in its uh, container ports, its refineries, its financial services. Um, it it's plays, I think, a key role, a pivotal role, in communicating between user states and coastal states. On the right-hand side are a bunch of con security concerns. We've heard about a couple of these already today, piracy, terrorism. I'd like to emphasize a few others. Poaching, illegal unregulated or unreported fishing is a huge issue for some coastal states. Pollution is mentioned. Safety, just managing the traffic flow as it gets higher and higher. Trafficking, trafficking in drugs, in weapons, in people is a major concern for some countries as well. The bottom line here, and the one I think is most pressing in the minds of coastal states, is burden sharing. One thing for all of us to remember is that most of the shipping that goes through the Strait of Malacca, 80% by some estimates, goes all the way through. From, and it doesn't stop anywhere in the Strait. It's totally transit traffic. Yet the coastal states are expected to provide most of the burden for managing this flow safely. And they would like to share that burden. That's the new message we've been hearing for uh, several months, maybe a few years. It wasn't always that way. Uh, the U.S. and Japan in particular certainly raised the alarm after uh, Lloyd's uh, Joint War Committee declared uh, the Strait of Malacca a war risk zone starting in June 2005. Japan has long been concerned about piracy and had some early, very ambitious programs, such as their ocean peacekeeping program for coordinated naval and coast guard patrols in the strait. Uh, that didn't go over very well, but um, they have since come up with many other programs to try and pursue the same objectives. The U.S., uh, especially after September 11, 2001, initiated several programs as part of its global war on terrorism. Some are global programs like CSI, the Container Security Initiative, PSI, the Proliferation Security Initiative. Uh, the third one, I think briefly mentioned, uh, alluded to by Michael, the Regional Maritime Security Initiative. And I think um, these are listed in the order of their success. The Container Security Initiative, CSI, has been fairly successful. There's an enormous economic incentive for all nations, and especially ports, to comply with it. The PSI is getting mixed reviews, even bad reviews, in the past day or two. Uh, RMSI uh, no longer exists. It's murmured as a historical footnote. Uh, but the interest has, has been transformed into uh, other, perhaps, 
uh, less assertive uh, initiatives of the United States. Things look a little different from the perspective of the coastal states. This is what they look like. This is what they looked like in 1997 uh, when something happened that really caught the attention of the coastal states uh, that was um, rather striking. They see things not only differently but differently from each other and their view is often clouded literally by uh, smoke haze. These are covers of magazines you may recall from 1997 which described an one extraordinary transboundary pollution problem. Uh, the sources of it were fires deliberately uh, set in Indonesia, Sumatra and Borneo to clear the land. And like lots of pollution that affect the south, uh, the uh, Strait of Malacca, it's based in land. A lot of air and water pollution problems in the Straits are based on land, uh, whether it's industrial, agricultural, or residential runoff. You might say the same thing for, for piracy. Piracy begins and ends on land. So we have to broaden our perspective of what the source of the problem is to figure out what to do about it. Uh, there was, I think, a conceptual breakthrough, and perhaps not much more, in 1997 as a result of this smoke haze incident. The countries in the region realized that this is a regional phenomenon, a regional problem, and however much we may prize our national sovereignty, none of us alone can solve it. We have to work together to do something about it. And they started doing that uh, through a regional haze action program. I don't think it's made a lot of progress in the past several years. The problem is still around, but it did show us some things that may be of use on other pollution, transboundary pollution, and security issues, such as satellite monitoring. The picture on the left is from a NOAA satellite back in 1997, and you can, you can see how uh, difficult it was uh, in certainly right through the strait, the strait of Malacca and the Singapore Strait. Uh, there were a lot of cases of near collisions and collisions uh, especially with small ships uh, in the area. Now, here's another one over here on the right. It's part of the agreement of the Regional Haze Action Plan. Um, the um, Center for Remote Imaging, Sensing, and Processing, I think it is, has put up a satellite in geosynchronous orbit over the strait, looking down specifically to map regional haze. And they have shown, you can see here, there are wind um, patterns. You can't really see it, I expect, very well from where you are, but they highlight um, hot spots uh, on the ground. This requires a fair amount of computing power and analytical capability, but that satellite can see everything and collect the data from everything it does, and then it's up to the programmers on the ground to figure out what aspect, what part of the light spectrum they want to code and check on. For example, they can also look at oil slicks, oil spills from ships. This is a very extensive collage of snapshots of satellite photos. And this very dark spot out here is where most of the ocean dumping goes. It's not in the strait over here. That's watched fairly closely. But once ships get out into the high seas beyond any territorial limits, that's where they seem to dump uh, their waste oil and other materials. And you can see this in this, this one particular snapshot. Some of the things you can't see by satellite are the fish. They migrate. Uh, we know they're there uh, by measuring the catches of the number of ships, uh, where they come and go. Uh, it's, uh, as I said before, a lot of mackerel, sardines, uh, northern bluefin tuna, very important in terms of a source of food and employment for people in the region. I'd like to say a few words by contrast to what you heard from Zara about piracy. Given what I've already said, piracy comes about third or fourth on the list of priorities of coastal states. And one reason is you just do the math and you come up with perhaps a different conclusion. In the year 2005, 
I said nine. Actually, this is a mistake. It should be 12 actual and attempted attacks, according to the Piracy Reporting Center. So that's nine or 10 or 12, some number like that in the numerator, and 63,000 below the line in the denominator. So the risk of piracy is about 0 0.00014. That's a very low risk. Further, most ships attacked, as Zara pointed out, are relatively small ships, fishing vessels. The average loss is under $5,000. So there's little incentive for shippers to report attacks or to take preventive measures. If they wanted to take preventive measures, they could pick from a cafeteria uh, abundance of options from ship lock to uh, secure ship fencing and all kinds of other devices. If they wanted to spend the money to do something about piracy, ship owners could. They could even hire a security force to come on board and uh, help them uh, uh, navigate any dangerous uh, waters. By contrast, Please note the bottom line, Indonesia, this was last year, estimated an annual loss due to illegal fishing of poaching at $4 billion. So I'm sort of a piracy skeptic on this issue, and we may have things we can talk about here today on this issue. Concerning a maritime terrorist attack, I, I would agree with what Zara said. There seem to be several disadvantages to doing so, perhaps a few advantages. If I were a terrorist and I had a limited budget, I'm not sure how much effort and time I'd, I'd uh, spend on a maritime attack as compared to, say, um, hijacking or kidnapping a busload of kids at the Singapore International School uh, and making my point in that way with a couple of people. Um, to summarize my views, I, I think it, it, there haven't been any uh, major terrorist attack or hijackings yet in the strait. So I would say the risk is very low, but the consequences could be, could be huge. Nonetheless, however different user states and coastal states may view their security priorities, they do have some common interests. Um, and I've listed the major mandate for them to cooperate in the United Nations Conference Convention on the Law of the Sea. Uh, they can cooperate to establish and maintain navigational and safety aids to prevent, reduce, and control pollution from ships. And they have done a lot of this already, and they're talking about others. Here is a progress report. This is my clue to check my watch to see how I'm doing for time. Two more minutes? So I'm going to let uh, Braun deal with all these difficult issues here at the end, except to say that there are a lot of things that are going on already by different players, most notably the air and naval patrols of Malaysia, Singapore, and Indonesia. Uh, at the very bottom, one worth, oops, excuse me a second, one worth noting is the tripartite technical experts group. This is, again, a joint effort of, of Malaysia, Indonesia, and Singapore to try and use these working groups to funnel outside user or shipping industry concerns uh, to them as the coastal states with major responsibility for, <coughs> for this. This is what they talked about two months ago in Kuala Lumpur. The conference there was entitled Safety, Security, Environment in the Straits. They proposed setting up a forum for all stakeholders to talk about safety of navigation, uh, to talk about maritime security. They listed a couple of very specific projects they want funding for, to remove shipwrecks, to set up a hazardous and noxious substance response center, uh, to put uh, in place uh, <clears throat> a number of uh, automatic um, uh, identification systems, especially for small ships, aids to navigation. They listed about 22 specific beacons and buoys that need to get fixed that have not yet been repaired since the tsunami. So they're fairly specific and practical in stating what their common interests are. What they haven't resolved is point number three, funding uh, this burden sharing. How should they do it? Shall they rely on voluntary contributions? 
Japan has made quite a, a, a number of voluntary contributions over the years. I'm not sure they're going to continue to do this forever and ever. China has made a few pledges. Uh, others have said, well, perhaps we should have tolls or pay-as-you-go fees or, or assign it per ship or per tonnage or, or some other measure. And that leads to yet another question. Whatever they may agree on, who's actually going to do this? All of these questions here at the end have question marks. So I get to my conclusion, which is that I think there are a bunch of enclosure movements going on in the Strait of Malacca. The coastal states want to exert more control over resources, including navigation as well as intrinsic, intrinsic national resources. Uh, major user states, especially the United States, wants naval security uh, to be able to uh, send its ships through there without restriction. There's some concern about conservation. All of them together have been unresolved, uh, but the stakes keep getting higher. And I'll end with one quote from Sir Walter Raleigh. He said it four centuries ago. It's still relevant for whosoever commands the sea commands the trade. Whosoever commands the trade of the world commands the riches of the world and consequently the world itself. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Rosenberg. Well, last but not least, uh, we're going to hear from uh, uh, Bronson Percival. Uh, he is the Senior Advisor for Southeast Asia and Terrorism in Asia at the uh, Center for Naval Analyses. After the September 11th attacks, he was appointed Director of the Southeast Asia Office at the State Department's Bureau of Intelligence and Research. And he later served as Coordinator for Counterterrorism at State's Bureau of East Asian and Pacific Affairs. And he's now undertaking a study on how to enhance maritime security in Southeast Asia, which I understand he's going to speak ab about now. Thank you very much. It's always difficult to be the fourth person after about an hour. But uh, let me quickly wrap things up uh, as uh, perhaps a review. Talk to you a little bit about the spaghetti ball of uh, proposals and programs that have been advanced by all kinds of interested parties, all the way from littoral countries, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Singapore, to uh, uh, international organizations, and maybe say something uh, intelligent about some of the challenges in the next few years. One of the first things I want to do is, uh, is uh, state a caveat. Um, for all the aid to the coastal countries uh, along the Strait of Malacca, from Japan and the United States, for all the actions that these countries have undertaken on their own, for all the hot air and hot ink that has gone into innumerable conferences and articles, and especially um, newspaper articles about the subject of maritime terrorism in the state of Malacca, um, we don't really know um, if maritime security in the Strait has improved. It's very hard to prove a negative. There hasn't been an incident of maritime terrorism. Piracy is declining and has been steadily declining for several years. And costly environmental damage hasn't taken place. So we know that there's a correlation between all the actions that have been undertaken and apparently an improved security situation, but we really don't know what has caused the improvement. For instance, it's perfectly possible that the real reason for the decline in piracy has been a campaign by the Indonesians to clean out pirate lairs in Sumatra. Uh, let me talk a little bit uh, about the threats as I see them um, from perhaps the least pressing to some of the greatest consequence. Um, contrary to David, um, I don't really think uh, safety and environment are the most pressing issues. Yes, haze is a major issue, um, but it has little to do with the Strait of Malacca. Uh, the last major collision that I know of was in 1992. Yes, Indonesia loses a huge amount of money from illegal fishing. Almost all of that, however, is in the eastern waters of Indonesia, a thousand miles away from the Strait of Malacca. 
Um, piracy, we've seen a steady decline from 38 incidents in 2004 to 18 in 2005 and eight in the first, six, uh, first nine months of this year. And that was reflected in the fact that uh, Lloyd's of London uh, lifted their war risk uh, premium for sailing through the Strait of Malacca. Maritime terrorism hasn't taken place. Uh, a number of people have looked at the threat of maritime terrorism, and I think all the way back in 2005, some conclusions were reached. Um, as Ms. Raymond said, the most serious threat is mines. Uh, perhaps the second most serious is an attack on a passenger ship or a ferry. Um, it's very, very difficult to assess the consequences of a maritime terrorist attack because they have very little to do with the attack itself. They actually have to do with how public and governments react to the attack. Probably the most serious threat since we're talking about China's energy supply lines in the Strait of Malacca is to go back to Michael's um, scenario, the Taiwan scenario. I was tempted not to talk about it at all since it's so improbable, but a Chinese a military attack on Taiwan could have consequences for the Strait of Malacca. The U.S. Navy could, it's very unlikely, but could be employed to interrupt Chinese shipping lines. Uh, but the questions, there are an awful lot of questions that come up with this. Would the U.S. government really seriously consider interfering with oil shipments to China, given the practical problems of separating out uh, Chinese oil or oil destined for China and the diplomatic cost of doing so? It's awfully hard to conceive of that, given how long a blockade would, uh, would take to have an effect. Um, the second thing we'd have to ask is how long could China survive, survive such a blockade? And I turn to others who know much more about it, but I know they're building a petroleum strategic reserve, and they do import an awful lot of oil uh, by other means. The third thing is could the Chinese Navy effectively interfere with such an attempt? And the answer is no. Now, let me turn from uh, speculation about very improbable scenarios to a little bit of the modern history of, um, of proposals and programs uh, and talk a little bit about who the players are. Um, over the past few years, we've seen the littoral states, what I call the littoral states, call them the coastal states, what I call the stakeholders, which is Japan, India, China, and the U.S., uh, international organizations and regional organizations and international commerce all playing a role in this. One of the interesting things is to see that ASEAN itself has not had a role. Um, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore, um, they've done a number of things. First of all, you have uh, Malcindo, the coordinated uh, patrols, started in July uh, 2004 have moved on to standard operating procedures. Uh, you have Eye in the Sky, uh, which is the same countries all over again, uh, conducting air uh, surveillance patrols. You have bilateral arrangements. And the thing I mentioned about Indonesia uh, going into um, coastal provinces along the coast of Sumatra and uh, cleaning out some of those areas. In Japan, Japan's been very active for a very long time. The Japanese Coast Guard has been doing bilateral exercises um, with uh, the countries of Southeast Asia since 2000. Japan's contributed over $100 million to the maintenance of <coughs> navigation aids in the Strait of Malacca. Japan has transferred an awful lot of hulls and other resources to Indonesia. And Japan is the driving force behind uh, RECAP, which is a program through ASEAN Plus Three, which is the ASEAN states, China, Japan, and South Korea, um, 
to set up what will be a piracy reporting center in uh, Singapore. The United States has been much more active than I think a lot of people realize. Um, several million dollars have been poured into the Indonesian Maritime Police. The United States is going to be funding the coastal radars for Indonesia. The United States did attempt to coordinate uh, donors for the Strait of Malacca back in February 2006. And the United States is trying to figure out how it can work much more closely with the Indonesian Navy. China, what's more, most interesting about China is its restraint. Um, we know that the Chinese are very anxious about their energy dependence, including through the Strait of Malacca. But China has held off. It really wasn't until the KLIMO meeting in September of this year that China signed up to fund some of the proposals um, that were mentioned uh, earlier. India has used its navy for bilateral uh, exercises with Singapore, Indonesia, and Malaysia, all Mala although Malaysia has been the most reluctant. Um, Going back again to the ASEAN plus three, this recap agreement, neither Indonesia nor Malaysia have signed on to this yet. And if they don't, it's going to be meaningless. Um, turning to the International Maritime Organization, they've sponsored two major mm -hmm. conferences, one in Jakarta in 2005, one in KL in 2006 to encourage cooperation between the user states and the littoral states. Um, they seem to be the driving force between the Maritime Electronic Highway. I'm not quite sure what that is. I hope it'll come up and I'll learn some more about it. Um, there's something called the ISPS code, which is a worldwide code to enhance uh, safety on ships themselves. And under that, uh, and that applies to all ships over 500 tons. Uh, metric tons. Um, there's also an automatic identification system, an AIS, uh, which is mandated for all ships over 300 tons, which should help one track ships. Um, the problem is it can be turned off, and often is. And of course, um, the International Maritime Bureau's Piracy Reporting Center in Kuala Lumpur is the source for most of our statistics. Uh, Lloyds of London brought an awful lot of pressure on coastal states through its war risk insurance premium for going through the Strait of Malacca. Um, and of course, commercial shipping firms bear the burden of implementing the ISPS, which is anywhere from $1.3 to $2 billion. Um, let me talk a little bit about what I call disappointments. I guess the way I see it, um, one of the great disappointments is Malaysia's ambivalence in the last three years. It's really, it, the, Malaysia's more trade dependent than Singapore is, but it's largely been reactive, uh, both to press reporting and to pressure from Lloyd's Insurance. Malaysia really had a chance to step forward and be a leader on this, and I think it left the leadership to Singapore. And now we have the Malaysian Ship Owners Association calling for a mandatory system of funding navigational safety and security in the Somme. It's a non-starter. It's tolls in, in the Strait of Malacca. It's just not going to happen. The other thing I think is a little disappointing is the lack of coordination between the Japanese and the United States. Uh, both have made a major effort uh, to assist the countries, assist Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore. Well, Indonesia and Malaysia, because Singapore is perfectly capable of doing whatever uh, in terms of maritime security, but um, it hasn't been very well coordinated. Let me talk for a second about the challenges I see over the next, oh, three to five years. Seems to me the biggest one is going to be how you find, how you accommodate both Chinese and Indian uh, energy angst, um, and how you find very transparent roles for China and India. 
The second one is how are you going to get more attention among the Indonesian elite to maritime security? I don't know how you do it. The third is how do you develop technical means to better identify, track, and share information about ships in the strait? The fourth is a system of burden sharing, but this is extremely difficult because it carries with it the implication that it might violate the principle of freedom of navigation. And the fifth is how do you develop the capability in, and it has to be I think, in the littoral states um, to react very rapidly. Um, for instance, to react to a terrorist uh, takeover of a passenger ship, something like that. And last but not least, for the United States at least, uh, one of the big questions is going to be what are the implications of a situation like that in the Strait of Malacca for our CNO's proposal for a thousand ship navy, which is essentially a cooperative constabulatory <coughs> effort to handle maritime security. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you to all four of you for some interesting uh, uh, presentations. Well, we sh we have a good amount of time for questions, and I'm assuming that some of you will have some questions for the speakers. So, uh, I ask that uh, you wait. Uh, we're going to have two microphones on either side of the auditorium. Wait until the mic arrives, and then please state your name and affiliation, and uh, please try to keep your question or comment brief. So, okay. First question. Yes, in the back. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Hasim Bakti from the Embassy of Indonesia. And it's been very interesting to follow up all these uh, presentation regarding Strait Malacca. I think uh, Indonesia is also very concerned with the issue. And, and uh, we are, um, Indonesia has also has been working very hard with the other littoral state, which is Malaysia, as well as uh, Singapore for the uh, s security of the uh, Singapore Strait. As we talk about Strait of Malacca, um, sometimes when I, uh, when I was listening to your presentation, it seems that uh, Strait of Malacca has been very scary for us. As uh, you know, you bring, you brought a lot of data that has there has been a number of attacks and so on and so on. But here, I really appreciate what uh, Mr. David Rosenberg has said that actually, uh, compared to the number of actual attack, then the I would say the threat of piracy actually is very low there. So what I would like to underline here is that what we need before we go to with the discuss, we need the right data of this. Because the wrong data I believe could lead to the wrong assessment and the wrong assessment actually could also lead to the wrong response to the actual problems in the Strait of Malacca. In this regard uh, probably from the my personal point of view, um, what we really encourage right now is how we actually develop this system of burden of sharing. And in this regard, what Japan has done actually is very um, helpful for the lateral state as they have been extended this voluntary um, assistance to develop the capability as well as the uh, development of safety navigation in the strait. And probably that's the things that the littoral states like Indonesia is re uh, really needs right now. Thank you very much. Probably that's just a statement, but uh, what I really need is uh, a clear perception on the security of the Malacca itself and not to be confused with what we call piracy as well as arm robbery. As arm robbery usually as uh, Ms. Sarah has said, has also um, happened a number of it in the um, ports. So we also need what actually the electoral state is also the development of capability of uh, officers in the ports to s ensure that security also being uh, carried out well in the ports. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next question. Okay. Uh, Let's start all the way in the back with that familiar face back there. And then... Uh, uh, thanks, Michael. I'm Bob Hathaway. I 
run the Asia program here. Michael had to call on me because I sign his paycheck. <laughs> um, let me just make a very brief um, addition to what our previous speaker just said. Uh, I think she's exactly right, as several of our speakers have pointed out. Statistically, a major disaster is not very likely. Um, but I think one of the lessons from September 11th is that um, we also need to be worried about the unlikely uh, disasters as well. Uh, and I'm quite sure that uh, a representative from the embassy would, would not disagree with that. Um, I have a question about India. Several of you have mentioned India. Um, India's interests in the Strait of Malacca are less obvious than those, say, of uh, Japan or China. Um, could any of our speakers uh, spell out a bit more Indian interest in and thinking about um, security in the Strait? Um, I guess I'll give it a try. Um, I think Indian interest in the Strait of Malacca is really part of two things. One is India is reorienting its strategic vision more towards the Indian Ocean itself in a much broader way. Um, the second is India is attempting, has long been attempting for 15 years now, basically to copy what China's doing in Southeast Asia with far fewer resources in their local east policy. And much of this comes together for India in uh, its closest relationships um, with Singapore and, Malay and Indonesia um, in Southeast Asia. So I think India has, does have a very capable Navy and they have used their navy as uh, and naval exercises as a way to, what should we call it, raise their profile, um, offering to help, eagerly offering to help wherever they can um, in improving security in the Strait of Malacca. Can I just add one more, one or two more things? A lot of seamen are Indian, a uh, disproportionately large number. And a lot of uh, old ships end up on uh, some beach in India to get deconstructed and recycled uh, for its scrap metal value. So in governmental and non-governmental ways, uh, India is looking at a look east policy, which has been articulated now for about at least six or seven years, to uh, reconnect with and through exercises, training, confidence building measures uh, with other partners, willing partners in the so around the South China Sea. Just, uh, you know, from a, from a strictly energy perspective, I just add one little wrinkle. India is moving in the direction of becoming a, a big uh, refining export uh, center, uh, importing crude because it's a large, you know, two-thirds of its oil, crude oil uh, is imported. But uh, with giant refineries that they're in the process of building and putting together, uh, which will be exporting finished products out to East Asia. So uh, they will have an important stake in sending uh, oil products through the, the Straits uh, out to East Asia as well over time, and that's going to grow to a very large, uh, large number of uh, you know products moving through there. And product tankers, frankly, are much more vulnerable, scary uh, than our crude tankers. I mean, product tankers blow up, gasoline, uh, kerosene; those things do blow up, and all you have to do is light a match. Uh, so I, I think, you know, they'll, they'll actually have a concrete energy interest uh, as time goes on and the Straits, some, some very concrete interest in the security of tankers moving through there. Here was a question, yes, the gentleman with the gray suit jacket and the blue tie. Uh, Walter Lohman with U.S. ASEAN Council. Uh, just to keep this in perspective, could the panelists comment on the feasibility and the increased cost of the alternative routes uh, to the Malacca Straits, uh, just to get a, a sense of perspective if there were some sort of catastrophic uh, attack in the Straits and alternative routes had to be used? You know, I, I, I've not seen any real metrics for that, so I can't, you know, I'm not very good at addressing that issue. Uh, 
I think my, what I recall hearing is that you add, if you go f rather than the Malacca Straits, you go around through the, the uh, Sunda uh, Straits, Lombok Straits. It adds three to five days steaming time, something like that. That's not a big, big issue in terms of cost. You know, it's extra steaming time, crew time, and it's a very cutthroat competitive business. Uh, so it, it, it's, it's not so much it's a, you know, and you can in theory go all the way around Java uh, and, and further east if you need to. Uh, the, so the real question of what impact it would have on prices if you somehow had a closure of the straits uh, has to do with the lack of shipping capacity because that just by, by definition absorbs a lot of extra time on tankers, therefore your shipping capacity gets absorbed. And suddenly everybody's bidding for tanker space, driving up the price of shipped, you know, delivered oil in East Asia. Uh, the second thing to take into account is if there's any kind of violent incident in the, in the Straits, insurance rates skyrocket and some, some, you know, some, in some cases you cannot get insurance. Uh, to give an example, during the, the, the tanker war during the Gulf War in the mid-80s, uh, you could not get a tanker from Kuwait insured to go out through the Straits of Hormuz with the Iranian gunboats going after uh, tankers. You know, very few of those were getting hit, but it only takes a couple, and suddenly there's no insurance available, or insurance rates uh, go sky high. So the combination of, of lack of being able to deliver enough oil to Asia, and this would affect LNG as well, without any real uh, spare ability to meet that need, you'd have a pretty significant price event, uh, even though the actual technical cost of steaming, you know, an extra five days isn't, isn't all that much, or even a week. Uh, it's probably 10 or 12 days if you go around, all the way around Australia, you know, which is an extreme scenario. It's the, it's the way that everything fits together where the price effect really hits you. I once did some calculations about that. What would happen if it would took 20, 25 days rather than 20 days to get from the Middle East to East Asia? That's basically what we're talking about. There's only 3,500 oil tankers total in the whole world. And so they would have to be redeployed. Uh, the net cost actually is not that much. Another 10% increase in the total cost of a gallon of gas at the pump due to transportation increase, going that extra tw extra five days. Nonetheless, uh, it's a very competitive market, and another 10% could, could have a big impact. Uh, just, just as a comment on that, it's, it's more than just a cost issue. I mean, because you, what you do is suddenly uh, China, Japan, Korea, Taiwan are short of oil, and so so in a commodity market, and this all depends on the character of the market that this happens in. If it's in today's market where you have very little spare capacity, the tanker fleet is, is almost fully utilized, uh, very tight, you know, like every other part of the chain, from, from refining to crude supply. Uh, it doesn't take very much to have a really disproportionate price effect. Uh, in a commodity market where you're already operating at 95% plus on an 85 million barrel a day oil, oil system. And that's why every little, every little attack in the Niger Delta causes, you know, a price effect. This is absurd, but it reflects how taut the market is across the board. So I think it would have a peculiar, in this kind of a marketplace, it would have a very large price effect, uh, at least for a period of weeks or depending on how, how long the shutoff was. In a, in a market of 1999 or 2000, when you had lots of spare capacity throughout the, the, the value chain, you know, it had almost, uh, almost no effect, so, or very little effect, just the cost passed on through the system. Did you want to add something? I was just going to say, um, we tried to do some work on this a couple years ago, and uh, one of the estimates we were working from was that it's about 500 bucks a day for each ship. Um, and then we tried to extrapolate out depending on market conditions and things like that, and we just we couldn't do it. It all depends on the reaction of the markets, governments, so on and so forth. Okay. Uh, Mark, there's a question right up here in the front. 
<coughs> Actually, there are two. Uh, first, this gentleman here, and then the one right next to him. Thank you. My name is Shiba Sang from GID. Um, as uh, one of the uh, long-term solutions, not the solution, but uh, one of the potential long-term solutions, uh, there have been suggestions to build a canal uh, in the southern part of Thailand called Kura Canal. It's a 100 kilometer long canal. And uh, there have been a lot of interest uh, expressed, of course, by Thailand, but um, by, uh, by Japan, Korea, and maybe China. And I was wondering if you uh, have any views or opinions about this uh, proposal. Thank you. Why don't you ask your question as well, and then we can answer both of them. Greg Rio from Radio Free Asia. Uh, since China is building an authority route uh, from land from Myanmar to China, I want to see how, uh, how effective this land uh, 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 pipeline can uh, help the, the Chinese to, to solve its uh, 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 strategic dilemma. This is the first question. The second question is a little bit out of the scope of today's topic, but which I think is more permanent. According to the uh, Washington Times report on Monday, uh, it is the first time uh, there is a, a Chinese uh, a, a Songka submarine stale the U.S. Uh, uh, Kitty Hawk carriers. It happened on October the 26th last month. Uh, it's only within uh, 10 miles that uh, the Kitty Hawk uh, war carrier figured out there is a, there is a, a Chinese submarine beside. So uh, it is, is that the, the threat from the uh, Chinese uh, submarine to, to, to pose an uh, uh, obvious threat to, to Americans' uh, uh, carriers? Yeah, thank you. I can uh, give a, a quick response to all three very, first of all, the Kra Canal is an old idea. I think it goes back four centuries. Um, there's a website out there you can check of some avid proponents of this in Thailand. There's some interest in Japan. Um, the technical issues are huge. I don't think it would s uh, reduce any piracy or terrorism necessarily, but it might help in navigation. There are other alternatives also proposed, pipelines in particular. That gets to the second point. I, my own view is that there, there are some serious possibilities for a, a China-Myanmar energy connection and pipeline. And I presume that's behind a lot of Chinese investment and port facilities and looking at uh, further routes up to Kashgar. Third, um, the third point was about the Chinese lurking submarine. Is that, and the question was, Um, I don't know whether it poses a threat, but I can certainly say that there's a big increase in sales of submarines to many countries around uh, the Strait of Malacca and the South China Sea. There is something of a naval arms race going on slowly in the area. And I look out in this audience and I see there may be some people who have some more information about that. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, it seems like uh, it's going beyond just force modernization. Anyone else? All right, uh, next question. Why don't we go back to the back, Bumika, to the woman uh, uh, with the, uh, the tan uh, sweater? Yes. <laughs> Be careful. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Heather Williams. Uh, I'm from Answer Analytic Services. And burden sharing really came across as a theme. You all touched upon it. And so I was wondering, do you believe that any broader organizations like the OECD could play any sort of a role in, securi in security in the area? Or is this, should it stay a regional, um, the responsibility of regional organizations in the coastal states? Mm. That's a good question. I. Uh, there are so many different combinations of interests. We mentioned a little bit about ASEAN, ASEAN Regional Forum, APEC is interested. There's the Five Power Defense Arrangements Group. They're, they're involved and just had some interesting interdiction exercises last month. 
Uh, the only thing I think is, is really key is that the coastal states want to maintain their sovereignty but get as much help from others as possible, granting as much voice and transparency and accountability to those potential donor nations. Um, there is, other than that, uh, as Bronson said before, it's like a spaghetti bowl of, of options and, and it's, it seems like uh, very hard to unravel them all into any, any consensus agreement. Okay, we have time for a few more questions. Uh, why don't we go to this gentleman here? Hi, I'm Leon Morse with Commonics International. And um, I think um, Ms. Zara Raymond can probably best answer my question, which is, was there ever a connection shown between piracy in the Straits and the free Aceh movement? And now that there's a peace agreement in Aceh, is it, um, is it the fact that, um, that piracy is even less of a, of a threat than it was before? Um, yeah, I think the, there was a, I think although there was actually no real evidence to prove that um, GAM or the Free Aceh Movement was committing pirate attacks in the Malacca Straits. I think that sort of anecdotal evidence suggested that they were. Um, and the peace agreement and the subsequent disarmament of the group um, has been um, cited as one of the reasons for the decline in piracy in the Malacca Straits. Uh, but there are I think a number of other different um, perpetrators of piracy. Um, so, for example, just um, sort of small-scale petty criminals, uh, local Indonesians living in coastal areas, also members of TNI or the Indonesian Armed Forces themselves uh, have been reported to commit acts of piracy. But yes, you're right. Um, I think GAM definitely was involved uh, in some of the pirate attacks. Uh, and maybe some of the more sophisticated ones where people or crew members were taken hostage. Can I just make uh, one comment on that? Um, while it's perfectly possible that GAM members were involved in piracy and there's a lot of in information that suggested they might be, I could be wrong, but I think I remember that there was never any convincing evidence that GAM as an organization was involved in piracy. It was not a, a, a decided tactic by Aceh Merdeka either to um, uh, earn money or get arms or anything like that. I have a quick one. From the um, piracy reporting log, July 3rd, 2006. Twelve pirates in a fishing boat approached a landing craft carrying UN tsunami relief cargo. Four pirates boarded, demanded money, the master gave them some cash, eight remaining pirates came on board, stole some diesel fuel, said they were members of GAM, and left. That's it's over. It's over. That's, that's the only mention we have in the past year concerning GAM. Okay, any other questions? Yes, uh, woman right there. Uh, I'm Jenny Petropoulou from the Greek Embassy. I would like, uh, you, you, uh, all of you mentioned that uh, the shipping industry is a stakeholder. Uh, how uh, exactly, in, in what specific ways could the shipping industry be involved in uh, security? In the Malacca Straits, and uh, what has, um, uh, in, in what ways could uh, uh, they interact with the governments uh, uh, of the coastal states and the other uh, user, the user uh, uh, states? Uh, thank you. Anybody want to? Um, well, just. Uh, from my experience um, in conferences on um, security in the Malacca Straits, the shipping industry has actually been very poorly represented. Um, so I think that, and I think that they're quite keen to um, kind of sort of almost limit their involvement because of the increased cost that any um, security measures would entail. 
Yes, a question right here. <clears throat> Peter Gwynn, National Geographic Magazine. Um, I'm curious about uh, the laws surrounding uh, ships carrying weapons or security personnel. I know that it's been a sort of a contentious issue about uh, you know, these private security firms uh, run out of Singapore and other places um, putting commandos on, on ships, uh, also ships carrying their own weapons. Uh, I know there's a big case about an Australian yachtsman that was uh, arrested carrying uh, weapons that he didn't declare at customs, and he claimed, you know, here I am traveling through the world's most dangerous pirate area. You know, what do you expect? You know, so, but I've never understood exactly what the, the maritime regulations are and, you know, how they apply inside the Malacca Strait. So anybody who can... Well, basically, the Malacca Straits is mainly made up of the jurisdiction of Malaysia and Indonesia, and the laws that apply to um, having a weapon, uh, a personal weapon, on land apply in the sea as well. So basically, if you want to carry a weapon um, on your vessel, which is going to pass through the territorial waters of Indonesia, which would have to, if you're going to go up the Malacca Straits, you'd have to have that weapon registered in Indonesia. And Indonesia is obviously not going to give you license to have that weapon registered um, if you're a private military company operating from Singapore. Uh, they're very keen to limit the involvement of private security companies in the waterway because obviously it uh, proves or shows that their security is inadequate. Um, but there have been, as you said, a number of, mm, a, a few companies operating uh, who did claim to have armed guards on ships, uh, and it actually provoked a massive outcry um, when it was discovered by Malaysia and Indonesia. Uh, as far as I'm aware, these companies, I mean, I asked some members of these companies, and they said that they would claim self-defense in the event of an incident. Uh, whether or not that would actually stand up in a court, um, I don't know. Um, my company has actually done uh, some um, operations of guarding oil rigs, and we uh, don't arm our guys because of the massive legal implications involved in doing so. Do you, either of you two want to add to that? No. Can I go back one question? Okay. I just thought of something in response to the prior question about what the shipping industry can do. They were uh, represented in numbers, if not in voice, at those meetings in Kuala Lumpur uh, last month. And I have a copy of the resolution that they, they signed and lists who was there and what they, uh, what they did. I'll be happy to share this with you. I have a couple of extra copies afterwards. Okay. Uh, are there any other questions? Okay, well, this has been very interesting for me, and I hope that you all uh, found, found the same. Why don't you please join me in applauding yeah. our four speakers uh, today. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. We're adjourned. Freezing.